Thank you, worship team. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, first Sabbath of the month, first Saturday of the of the year, and um, it's a new year, 2024. Who would have thunk it, eh? 2024, and it's great to be here. Um, being a chaplain in schools is a very interesting thing, and and one of those interesting aspects of being a chaplain is simply working with early learning centers. Early learning centers are exciting places to be purely because you don't have to do anything and everyone's engaged. You can get up the front, you can make a noise, you can do whatever you want, but all of a sudden all the all your audience is engaged. So much so. So much so that they want to tell you stuff. Slightly different to church. Slightly different to church. One of the things that I like to do whenever I rock up at an early learning center is teach the kids a song. And I usually take the guitar and all that kind of stuff. But I teach them a song and it's called The Sower. And I don't know if anyone's in the generation that would have heard this song. But um, it's a repeating song. And there's actions and all kinds of things. But it obviously tells the parable of the sower. All right. And it, it's quite a... Nom- uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it simply goes, the sower, and then the kids repeat back to you. The sower went out to sow, went out to sow, to plant some seeds, plant some seeds, and hope that they would grow. The sower then would go out to all the different sites of things. So the seeds would then land on the path, and the birds would come. So you teach the birds, the, uh, the birds. You teach the kids the actions, and, and they go, chip, 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 and then they eat the seed. And then the seed falls on the rocks, which is always a favorite in the ELC centers because the action for the rocks is you get your hand and you pat your head. Ow, ow, ow. And then the seeds fall into the thorns, which is always a tricky one because you don't want to you don't want to teach the kids bad things, but the thorns choke the seed. And so you've got you to think of different ways that you can illustrate that. And so the best I can come up with was just the noise. And so we had the whole ELC going. <sighs> and then the last one, the last one is the best one because it's the good soil. And you, you get the kids to get a hand and pat their tummy. Some of them get confused with their tummy and it's sometimes up here and up here and other places. But you get them to go like this and go, mmm. And then back when I was growing up, the song leaders up the front used to throw in the line of, it's French for yogurt. Do you remember those Yoplait ads for those that are my generation? Yoplait, it's French for yogurt. I don't actually know if it is. It's not. There we go. It's not. I've been sold a lie. It's changed my whole childhood. But it's, it's a lesson that we're, we're teaching the kids these Bible stories that Jesus told. And the funny thing is, if we look throughout the Bible, quite often we find that our lives are related to plants and trees and all this kind of stuff and, and soil and everything else. Just before the Christmas season, the festive season, um, I took my... Uh, three-year-old daughter out into the garden and we planted some corn it's awesome and um, we did the rows we got nice little rows we dug them out and we put the corn kernel seeds in the in the in the corn I had to convince her that you can't eat it right now and we we lined up the rows and and every single day we would go out and check it every single day we'd walk out the the back door and she'd go out and she'd look at it and go yeah nothing there today Nothing there yet. And then all of a sudden, these little green little things popped up and I just went, oh, they're probably weeds. But we won't, we will pretend they're corn to start with just in case. And now we've got six foot high corn. Six foot high corn around our backyard or in our backyard. And there's corn cobs happening and the husk is coming out and the husk is starting to turn brown, which is exciting. I find it exciting. I get to eat stuff. It's the festive season. You get to eat and it doesn't count. But we've just planted some more to see if it'll grow, to see if we can get a rotating crop sort of happening. Thanks, Beristane Bear Books, for those that um, 
have read those to their kids. But we've just planted some more. And so the whole process is starting again. We did the rows. We dug little holes. We put little seeds in. And now the whole process is starting again. And we've got beautiful weather for the seeds to germinate under the ground. And you're all looking at me going, why are you telling us about your garden? Well, there's a sort of theme that I want to I want to bring out for your new year. There's a theme that I want to bring out with new year because it's the process that those seeds go through, the cultivating that happens with those seeds that I want you to focus on this morning. Because I don't just want to talk about corn. I want to talk about something a little bit deeper. I want to talk about something that that happens to that seed. You see, those seeds have have this power, have this, have this um, potential within them to grow a six-foot-high corn stalk plant. And all it starts out is this dried-out little thing, and it grows into this living plant. Um, my wife and I went up to Marysville and on the way there, you've got to go through Black Spur and I don't know. Uh, it's one of my favorite drives in, in Victoria. Coming from Queensland, our bush is not quite like that. This isn't Black Spur Road, but it reminded me of it. And um, just the tall gums that you drive through and the light penetrating through it all. And um, you pop out the other side of the, the bush there. And it, it was rainy while we we're in there. But then as soon as you drove through, it was like literally a wall. And there was sunshine and stuff on the other side of the spur. But the, the, what I want you guys to focus in on today are actually these trees that are beside this road. And they are the giant redwoods. I don't know if you've had any um, exposure to redwoods and stuff. There are some out at Warburton a bit further out. They've just reopened. You can go and have a look at it. There's no toilets there or anything like that, but you can go have a look at these redwoods. And, and they're absolutely beautiful trees, massive monsters trees. And they need a certain climate to grow in. They, they can't just grow anywhere. You can't just go and plant it in your front yard and hope that'll grow. These things need the exact right climate. But the funny thing is, is they start out like the corn. They start out like the corn is this little seed that just sort of sits there. And, and it, it just sort of takes in what's around it. So in 2024, I want you to think of these seeds. In 2024, I want you to think of your life as a seed. And, and even though these, these are slightly more impressive than my, my corn, um, I want you to think about the redwoods, beautiful trees, beautiful trees that just shoot up to the sky. I don't know. I, I reckon I could sit there for ages. As I mentioned earlier, we're likened to trees and plants and gardens quite a fair bit in, in Scripture, in the Bible. And this is one of those verses in Isaiah. God's talking to the prophet Isaiah and it says to all, uh, Israel's been going through a hard time and he says to this, to all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of the mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks. They'll be like great oaks. And, and not only that, but that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They were great oaks that the Lord has planted. You see, it didn't happen by chance that these people were going through all this. The, the, the Lord had put them there and planted them there for an exact purpose, just like when you put the corn in the rows, just like the redwoods when they're, when they're planting and stuff. God has put them there for a purpose. And here we have God talking to Isaiah. And then we've got David. David talked about it as well. And in Psalms chapter 1, if you want to ever want to find Psalms in the Bible, just try and open up to the middle of the Bible. And it... In Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the uh, advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join with the mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves will never wither, and they prosper in all they do. And they prosper 
in all they do. But they're trees that are planted in the right spot at the right time for the right reasons. And they're there. And funnily enough, if you take that, that line of trees planted by a river, we could say exactly the same thing as every face looking this way today. All the ones running around the back, everything like that. You are planted in your seat for a reason. You are planted in, in, in this space, in this time, in this community for a reason. For a reason. When, um, when Matilda and I planted those seeds, we could see a future. We could see a future because when we planted the seeds, I knew what was coming. Matilda quite didn't understand what was coming, but I knew what was coming. The corn was coming. But, but the funny thing is, is quite often we will plant a seed and then just start to worry. We'll plant a seed and then just forget about it and it won't necessarily grow. But imagine if we could look at ourselves, if we could look at our seeds from the vantage point of God. Can you imagine what, what 2024 would look like looking at the from the perspective of God? He can see what's going to happen. He can see what's going to happen. And, and imagine if we could do that. And imagine if we, we thought we could do that and we think we can do that. But imagine if we lived like that. Imagine if we lived like we had the future in mind. If we lived like we had God's vantage point. Thriving, prospering, bearing fruit in each season. Use the words of Psalms. Um, quite often, we worry about the future. It makes sense. It makes sense. But how cool is it? In not 2020, but in 2020, in 2020, do you know what the most used marketing campaign was? Any guess? 2020 vision. 2020 vision, or something to do with sight was the most used marketing campaign in 2020. Funny, like it makes sense, of course. And we just went along with it. Um, but in 2020, the, the, the marketing campaigns were 2020 vision. And you've all heard the, the saying 2020 hindsight, like looking back on your life and going, oh yeah, that's right. But how cool is it to look back on your life and see the points in time that God has made a deviation? Or see the points in time where God goes, yep, you're on the right path, accelerate. Or you've seen the right times, or see the times where God's gone, righto, I'll let you stick at that for a little bit more, a little bit more. And then I want you to take this step now. And then I want you to go this way slightly. And then I want you to go over this side. But then I want you to go up the back of the church and then walk around. There's, there's times in your life, if you look back on your life and look through that lens of, of God's 2020 hindsight, you will see those positions. You'll see the trust. You'll see the, the, the sometimes that we ignore those instructions, but you'll see the effects of what God's doing in your life. Imagine if you did that with the future. You know he's got you. Imagine if you did that for the future. There's a, there's a classic um, section of text in, in, the, in uh, the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. And it's got to do with birds, not trees, but trees sort of get a mention. Um, it says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant trees or harvest or store food in barns for your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable than they are? I shouldn't have put them on the other side. Now I've got to switch sides. Should have worn my glasses. That would have been better too. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers, 
that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, and what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Not just some of them, he knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles are enough for today. Amazing. The promises in that stretch of text, the promises that are written there, the the underlying tones, everything that is in there is is kind of hinting at this. What perspective are you going to take? What perspective are you going to take? Are you going to take the perspective or the stance or the posture of worrying about the future? Or are you going to let God handle it and take the posture of God's got this and go for it? It's an interesting question. And my mind casts back to um, the story of the Red Sea, crossing of the Red Sea. And we, you can picture Moses and um, on, the, on the side of the mountain holding up his arms and the rod and stuff and, and the sea doing its thing. It would have been just a, magi- uh, a magical sight to see these water walls just opening up. But the thing that is interesting is, is someone had to take that first step. I don't know about you, but if I'm seeing walls of water, if I'm seeing walls of water up on each side and a path just open up miraculously in the ocean, I'm not meant to be walking on that ocean floor. That's all mud and stuff. There's, There's probably crabs and things running around in there. You're not meant to walk on that. That's ocean floor or sea floor or dam floor, whatever one it was, whatever it is. But someone had to take the first step. Do you think that person probably drew the short straw and got pushed out there? But do you think that that person went from the perspective of, nah, I'm just going to sit back and not see the perspective that my maker has given to me today? So your past should build confidence for your future. Your past should build the confidence for your future. And as we've just read in the book of Matthew, we've got these birds that don't even have to worry about stuff. They don't worry about the future. I wonder if they worry about their past. But but your past gives you who you are. Your past also gives you God's perspective. Your past gives you a perspective of a, good, a God that's full of goodness, a God that's full of grace, a God that's full of righteousness. And if that doesn't propel you to move forward with the perspective of God, I don't know. I really don't know. New Year. We've mentioned New Year's resolutions, new prom- well, promises for yourself, Uh, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to give you statistics on how many of those actually follow through and all that kind of stuff. However, we, we quite often describe God as the God of new beginnings. But he's also the God of the long game. He's also the God of the long game because if you take the redwood, for instance, if you take the redwood, for instance, it's this beautiful tree that would have started out as a seed. And then went into a sapling. And then to get to a redwood of this size, you're looking 500 years minimum. Minimum 500 years. We're, we've got a God of, of the long game. You see, right back when, when Adam and Eve first sinned, he put the long game into practice. And, and, and the plan of salvation started. And so the long game is important as well. So yes, he's the God of new beginnings. But yes, he's the God of the long game. And in the, in the book of Proverbs, we've got, you can make plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. How cool is that? There's a perspective. And then we've got another Bible verse in Ephesians, which is one of my personal favorite Bible verses. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he has planned for us long ago. 
You see, that hindsight that I've been talking about, that's part of the plan. That gives you the, the knowledge and understanding to go, right, oh, God's plan more for me. I'm going to step out. I'm going to be like that guy that crosses the Red Sea. I'm going to just go for it and change my perspective. And so if there was a New Year's resolution that I would encourage you today, it's that change your perspective. Lead 2024 into a, into a year that is led by God's perspective because we're planted here in these seats, in this community, in this area, in, in, in this church, with these people for a reason, on purpose. The other cool thing um, that I love about redwood trees, not a lot of people know this, um, but they've actually got a very shallow root system. Very shallow root system for a tree that size. And the way that they sort of work it, because what usually happens is a tree goes up and then the, the tree needs to grow down as high as it goes up. Le levers and stuff. You can tell I'm not a science teacher, huh? Levers and stuff. Um, so there's a tree. But however, these guys don't do that. These guys actually go up and spread out and as out, far out as they possibly can. And quite often you'll see redwood pines all in a massive clump. And the reason is, is as they grow up, their roots all grow out and their roots start to intertwine. You see, a redwood tree is no good by itself. A redwood tree would just simply lose its, its strength and it would just go and crash to the ground. It needs the other people. And funnily enough, the redwood tree, as they interlock and whatever else, as the wind blows a certain direction, somehow the roots all intertwine a bit tighter and the trees all bend. The community that the redwood tree needs is absolutely the perfect picture of community. You know what the other cool thing is? I love this. I love this bit. Is simply if a tree is hurting... If a tree doesn't have nutrients of some sort, the other trees will actually channel nutrients to that tree to keep their community strong. Can I give you another word for that? Church. We're a, a grove of redwood trees. And what if what if we as Burwood community, what if we were a grove of redwood trees that no matter what happens, no matter who's hurting, no matter what's going on, we're able to channel our resources into those people. We're able to lift them up, but also live with the perspective of the future of what God's got in store, the plans that he has for each and every one of us. And so as I wrap up, I want to finish with this verse in Isaiah. As I wrap up, I want to finish this verse in Isaiah. It says, to all Israel, who might have been having a tough year, who might have been having a tough time of it and, and, and struggling with what was going on. And they were, they were at war, they were doing all kinds of stuff that Israel did. And it says, to, the, to all who mourn in Israel, who will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair, in their righteousness, which we get from God, they will be like great oaks. I'm going to switch it out if I'm allowed. They'll be like great redwood trees that the Lord has planted in Burwood for his own glory.